comb form a little bit of details it, it's really you know it's hard to to see these pieces um, on the screen is one thing but it, when you see them in person it has a very different effect so this is kind of a little explore a couple of the details of the piece and how I'm able to get um, the uh, the design work into the glass and this is all done with the sandblasting process which involves putting a rubber tape on the surface of the glass and then drawing the design onto the glass, cutting it out with an X-Acto blade, exposing the areas that I want to be have carved. And so at one point, this was all sort of a beige brown color. And the stencil creates the lines and you sandblast everything away that's exposed and then that's how you get the design onto the glass. <clears throat> And these are uh, sculpted figures with these cast glass faces. Um, more detail shots. <laughs> um, and you know, since so since I didn't go to art school, I um, I was left to look at stuff that interested me. And, and I looked at the modern the modernist artists, you know, and they there was this. Um, uh, a quote that I read by a native scholar named Renard Strickland who said it was ironic that the modernists forced us to appreciate the primitive uh, and uh, also to appreciate differing levels of reality. And you know, I think you know, the students that are here might know that there is this movement called primitivism, which the modern artists were looking at objects from you know, the Native America, uh, from Africa, from oceanic cultures, and then making things that kind of, you know, looked a lot like that. I mean, so it gets to the, the, the question of, you know, were they appropriating, you know, certain kinds of styles? You know, here you've got Picasso with a, with a um, African uh, helmet there, sculpture. And so I decided that I would do a little of that exploration of my own and I look at kind of the modernists and and try to make work that was um, you know these spare organic forms that kind of referenced uh, the modernist art so I have my modernist fish um, and then there's a eagle raven so the top portion of the beak is the the eagle and then the bottom uh, angle is, is the raven with more of the straight beak and then they share an eye. So I'm playing with more abstractions now um, and sometimes they pertain to stories and sometimes they don't. Uh, this is the, um, the origin of mosquitoes. So you've got the mosquitoes biting through this guy here. Um, and again, you know, kind of playing with the idea of making my own amulet kinds of forms, this type of Thing. And then uh, the man in the moon. Um, this is a, to me, represents a feather. Um, and then again, just playing with these spare organic forms and and putting Northwest Coast uh, details on them. And this is a, a mussel shell. And as I call this one, the invocator of. Hidden Spirits. It's got the the land otter and the octopus on it, um, and then again playing you know kind of an abstraction of a killer whale. Um, but you know, for, so for me to 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 uh, uh, as a glass blower, I really had to um, be a quick study on on how to create these designs onto the glass and to make it look like Northwest Coast. I was always you know, had this um, drive to make it look as authentic as I could, even though I'm using this new material, um, um, you know, glass. But to me, I feel like it brings another dimension to indigenous art, um, you know, with this 
the way that the glass inter interplays with the, um, the material. Um, so I started going to these indigenous artist gatherings, which um, were by invitation. We went to Hawaii, um, and we, you know, so typically we're about, I don't know, about 100 artists, all from different media, uh, mediums and disciplines. And so here we are in Hawaii, you know, blowing glass. We had the, a little portable glass blowing furnace, and so I got to share with some of the people there how how I work and so I was also witnessing you know the things that they do this is a Pacific Islander here um, working on a piece of, uh, of wood um, and journey to Aotearoa it was um, the Maori uh, the indigenous people of New Zealand um, so this is a piece that I I did to kind of commemorate that journey um, and, and you know, it was just incredible. So I've been to about three of these gatherings now, and they're always very profound in, in you know, the, uh, you know, sharing our culture. And so here they're trying to teach me how to be a, a Maori warrior. And that was about uh, the, I, I don't know, I, my fierce look <laughs> wasn't, wasn't as quite convincing. Uh, but you know, these people are really incredible. And the fact that they are um, kind of unified as a group, um, their culture is really intact. So it's inspiring for me to go down there and see that, of course, you know, they're one culture and, uh, and two islands. And, of course, they have the clan connections and their clan disputes and all of that. But they're really incredibly uh, uh, amazing people and their artwork is, is just uh, stunning. And I got really into the idea of um, the mokos, the, the, their, their tattooing. So I, I, I asked them, I said, I, you know, now we started this friendship, you know, what could, I don't want to be culturally inappropriate, but what could you give me as a, as a moko? I, I think it's really uh, beautiful. And they said, I said something to do with the sun or, you know, fire or something, because I'm a glass blower. And they and I said, oh, yeah, that'd be easy. It should be ruau moko is the, the god of volcano and earthquakes. And so I said, yeah, that sounds good, you know, because we always think of the glass as the, the lava, you know, we're working the hot lava. And uh, so I, I went ahead with that, that design and I was showing it off, you know, I said, so hey, what was this guy's name again? Ruel Moko is, yeah, he was a god. Yeah, he was a god, right? He's like, yeah, he's a god. He's kind of a mama's boy. <laughs> you know, he's always trying to shake the earth or he's going to blow up a mountain and his mom's always trying to calm him down. I'm like, no. Oh. Okay, I mean, that's, but that's uh, indigenous humor for you. you, know, you get, um, so a little bit about collaborations. Um, you know, I've, I've been working collaboratively with several different indigenous people, um, sort of bringing them over into the glass uh, world. And this was... Uh, Maori jade carver named Lewis Gardner, and this was their uh, whale writer. You're probably familiar with that, but you know, in, the, in Alaska we have our own whale writer as well as um, um, uh, the the man who created the killer whale. And so, we were looking at different stories that might have similarities that between our two cultures, and um, and then of course combining the material of the jade. So the green is the jade. And this is like a canoe prow, and of course, in the Northwest Coast, we have canoe uh, traveling people as well. Um, this is the salmon mother myth, and this is the. Um, so these pieces of jade are quite large, you know. They're uh, so that's the one thing that he's doing is uh, Lewis is, uh, you know, pushing the scale, the limitation. Um, a uh, gallery that I was working with in Santa Fe asked me about, well, you know, we collaborated with all these native artists. What about Dante Marioni? What would you do? You know, how would you guys collaborate? You know, they started to represent Dante's work, and they wanted to uh, just challenge us to see what we would come up with. So these are some of the things that we did. Some of the first things that we did, I was thinking of um, basket forms, you know, with Dante's um, sort of masterful... Uh, uh, cane work that he does in his own work, uh, we came up with this series of pieces and played with lots of different kinds of um, effects. Um, 
Tammy Garcia was, um, is, is a Santa Clara Pueblo potter, and I was really a- attracted to her work because um, of the classical forms, and that was some of my foundation uh, as, a, as a glass blower. I was working with people who um, wanted to make these perfectly blown glass forms, and so I, um, I encouraged her to, to work with me, and it really actually did help cross the material over um, into, into the Native American art collector's minds. Uh, prior to that, I mean, I think the anthrop- you know, some anthropologists would like to keep it neatly contained within a little, I call it like a cultural corral. You know, this is how it was done, this is the traditional material, and that stuff doesn't belong here. But this, to me, kind of shows that we are living cultures and we are working with new materials. Um, who's to say that we shouldn't be able to experiment with uh, new mediums? Of course, Joe David is, uh, uh, and I have done a lot of work together. This is a, called this a, a Thunderbird egg. Um, and then a, a giant bracelet, which just becomes a canvas for the design work. Um, and then these headdresses, um, and using the cedar bark as the hair, which is more tradition with the wood carving. Um, and then working guys with guys like this, Buffalo Man, um, who I like to call as the original Native American glass artist because he um, uh, works with beads. He's a bead worker. Um, and that's what I always like to point out is that glass has a defining historical connection to Native culture, and it came through beads in the first place. Um, and these beads were adopted and, and or, you know, used as ornamentation for clothing and ceremonial um, objects. And so um, anyway, this, this is uh, Marcus's culture. So if I delve into another cultural style, I always do it with somebody else. I don't appropriate someone else's, else's cultural style. Um, and so this is from the mound builder culture from the Southern uh, American, uh, South, Southern America. Um, and it looks a lot like, you know, uh, Aztec or, or Mayan, you know, kinds of dec- decorations. Um, um, and uh, so anyway, that was fun. Um, and then some of the monumental works that I'm doing. This is a piece I did for the Seattle Art Museum. Of course, the boxes are quite large in their scale and have a lot of presence to them. This is the piece that went to the Corning Museum. It was the first box I actually ever made. I called it Never Twice the Same. Because um, a lot of these, um, you know, sometimes these, these things are decorated, but they're not, they don't have a particular meaning. You know, it's hard to put meaning into every act. People are always asking, well, what does this little detail mean? Well, it just looked good, I thought. You know, so I didn't. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to create a masterpiece that has like all of this, but you know, this this design style becomes a bit like calligraphy in a way. You know, you there's a fluidity to the design, and there's rules and regulations to the the architecture of the design and how it all works together. So, it's fun to play with that because you can really create infinite varieties of of designs, and so all of these are are are. Um, original designs that I put together. Um, this is a full-scale canoe paddle. Um, this is a really technically challenging piece to cast. This cast glass. This was the clan house piece. This is a little bit larger screen than the, the first one I showed you. This was for the Museum of Glass. And the one that I'm working on for the Sobolev Center um, uh, for the Alaskan um, piece is 12 feet by nine feet high. It's the biggest one I've ever done. Um, sometimes I go back to Dave's coffee shop, uh, my, my friend David Svensson. And um, so I wanted to create a piece that was, um, I wanted to do a cast glass totem pole because I thought I should be the first one to do it because of, anyway. Um, and so since I'm not a wood carver, I did a collaboration with David who um, you know, doesn't do this for a living or, or um, well, in, unless he's doing it 
for me now. He's sort of my ghost carver, I call him. Um, he uh, uh, so anyway, he has this ability, but he doesn't. You know, it's hard to um, uh, put yourself out there as a as a non-native Northwest Coast carver. Um, the people do do that. So this is a, a story uh, of my great grandmother who had a pet grizzly bear as a child, um, and so there was uh, some uh, family that was hunting, and they ended up shooting the the mother bear, this grizzly bear. It was you know it was her or them, and so they shot it, and they noticed that these little cubs were you know wandering around. So they grabbed one and they brought it back to the village and so my great grandmother she raised it as a pet and um, so that was a time when there was a lot of Russians in Sitka and so what she would do um, this bear had a taste for this taffy there was this Russian woman that would sell her taffy on the streets and you know carry it around in a basket (laughs) or something so my great grandmother would go out and pick berries and bring them back and she would sell the berries so she could get Russian money to buy taffy for her, her little her pet, and until it got to be too big to keep around the house, and then of course they ended up. I, the story goes that uh, someone took it and put it in a zoo somewhere. So that's what happened to the happened to the little guy, um, and uh, that's out of out of. Uh, so so here is the uh, the the totem. It's like. It's about 2,000 pounds of glass, um, and it sits in a high-rise apartment in Chicago. Um, so my accomplishments are not my own, but those are many. I, I, you know, the, these are the these are the people that help me uh, do my work. These are my um, uh, my team that help me in my studio. We're packed up to move into a bigger studio here, but um, so it was a nice shot. But that that saying for me also um, speaks to um, the the lineage that I'm a part of. I mean, I'm the guy that's doing this now. Um, I'm hoping that if if I'm successful with my own work, that I would inspire you know another generation to do something in their own way, the way that I've kind of found out how to work with glass because. The materials that we work with are becoming increasingly rare, like the the big logs for the cedar totems and the and the dugout canoes and what have you. So the needs of the people um, will be reflected in new materials. I'm convinced in the future, and it could be steel, it could be concrete, it could be you know stone. You know who who knows what the next um, step will be. But to keep those stories alive is um, you know, that's that's going to be the next step, I think. Um, so this is the studio that I moved into. I have a little hot shop, glass blowing studio. Um, and here's a little bit about the sandblasting. So that green that you see is the rubber tape. That's how we cut out the stencil. And when I'm doing the basket forms, this is how I uh, we lay the tape on the surface, and then we sandblast against this thin vinyl tape. And that creates the the patterning that um, that is uh, happens in the sandblaster. And so, what I really wanted to get to is my music. <laughs> um, start to feel like that, you know, those actors that are like, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an actor, but you haven't heard my band. You gotta come out and hear my band. Um, so this is I, I call it a Native American funk band uh, because that's the style of music that I like because it embodies the best of, uh, you know, uh, jazz and rock and soul and dance and even gospel music. So um, that's the, um, the style of music, but it's also kind of a, a performance art group. You know, we, are, uh, we have storytellers and, and actors, and, you know, so we come out with Northwest Coast uh, regalia and, and um, um, you know, do elements of spoken word and... And it's really uh, different. Um, it's not exactly, but it all it does have this kind of soul blues kind of style styling behind it. And we did we did release um, a CD. It's available on iTunes um, or through my website, littlebigband.com. Um, so anyway, we we put this together. It's after about um, 
seven years. <laughs> this is our this is our token white guy. Um, most of the musicians are 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 um, are Native American um, and or African American, and so this is James Luna, who's a uh, performance artist out of uh, San Diego. Um, and then, so this is the new project that um, I'm working on. I was going to play a little snippet of the music to kind of show you what we're doing. This is Bernie Worrell, who is um, a keyboard player for Parliament Funkadelic. I don't know if you know, some of you might know who that is, but um, Bootsy Collins. And anyway, so he was, he, uh, I uh, paid into a Kickstarter program to, um, to uh, play my 50th birthday. And um, he said he would drive that van out and uh, that tour bus that I was helping him buy and play a, a show for me. Um, and then the next night he would do a public show. And I said, well, I have a band. And he um, said, well, yeah, you should, you should open up for my band. You know? and, and I said, well, I'll, I'll check and see if we're available. Uh, um, uh, and so sure enough, we did the show. And then as we were parting ways, he said, you know, I, I've been thinking about your music and I got some ideas. We've got to work on some stuff. And so um, uh, I, uh, so this is a little bit of the, the style. And it'll have, this is a work in progress. This has uh, native voices that are also um, part of it. group is called Kuiks, which means potlatch in Clinkin. And potlatch to me is a, a sharing of culture and stories and, and dancing and music. And it's kind of a ceremonial Clinkin thing. spoken word stuff as well. And that's it. Okay. Support this and other great podcast content at our Patreon page, www.patreon.com forward slash artways. Tomaquag Arts programs are sponsored by the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts. Investment in arts and culture. Music presented by Eagle and Hawk. www.eagleandhawk.com <laughs>